What's up, fourth wall fans? I am Evasive, and today I'm going to be talking to you about what I believe to be one of the weirdest movies ever made. And the title of that movie is Sim... Symbio... Symbio... Now I know that's a bold claim. Some of you are going to be like, really, Ava? Weirdest movie ever made? I mean, come on. Have you ever seen Struinsky in the Mysterious House? I am the glob glow gab galab, the schwabble double wobble gobble flibber blah blah blah. I'm full of swimble glibber. Weird is a matter of taste, of course. What some people find weird is not going to be the same as what other people find weird. But trust me when I say that this film is a different type of weird. A type of weird that you probably haven't seen before. And this is a kind of weird that can't be defined by simple words like Schwabble double glibber glubber shribble trap glub. Dibble double shribble shrubble glibber glub schwab. Schwabble double glibber glubber shribble trap dub. Dibble double shribble shrubble. The film we're talking about today was created by William Greaves, a man born in Harlem in the 1920s. Greaves began his career as an actor before later moving behind the camera and finding success as a documentary filmmaker. In the late 1960s, he became an executive producer on the PBS civil rights educational show Black Journal, which earned him an Emmy Award in 1969. While he was working on Black Journal, Greaves continued working on his passion projects, including Symbiopsychotaxoplasm. Sim Psycho, but hang, hang on, I lost it. Symbiopsychotaxiplasm is a movie that Oh, how do I even describe this? Um, so in the summer of 1968, William Greaves brought a bunch of actors and a camera crew to Central Park, New York to film a scene for a fake short film called Over the Cliff. And while that was going on, he had another camera crew filming himself and the main camera crew. And while that was going on, he had a third camera crew filming onlookers and anything interesting going on in the park. And while that was going on, Greaves purposely acted like an incompetent asshole director who had no idea what he was doing in order to get footage of the film crews talking about him behind his back. The end result was three films rolled into one. It's a documentary of a fake movie scene, a documentary documenting a documentary, and a documentary documenting a documentary about a documentary. You know, maybe if we just read some production notes from William Greaves himself, that might help it make a little more sense. This film is a free fall in space. It is a study of the creative process in action. Also, the film is jazz. It is improvisation. It is an exploration into the future of cinema. The film is about fire, life fire, which is all around us. The task of our cameras is to spot and film the fire until, like fire hoses, they put the fire out. Is it a dream that has the facade of truth or truth that has the facade of a dream? Is it chaos masquerading as order or order simulating chaos? This film must be susceptible to analysis and yet it must be as unfathomable as the cosmos. Okay, let's see if I can explain this. So the title Psycho Sim Sim symbi Symbiopsychotaxiplasm comes from the concept of symbiotaxiplasm created by political scientist Arthur Bentley. Symbiotaxiplasm is described as those events that transpire in the course of anyone's life that have an impact on the consciousness and the psyche of the average human being and how that human being also controls or affects changes or has an impact on the environment. With the word psycho thrown in to emphasize that this movie is psychotic. As you might expect, this is not structured like a normal film. It's more of a mash of random behind the scenes shots edited together with Miles Davis jazz music. So instead of trying to explain the movie in order, I'm just going to explain what's going on with each of the individual cameras here, camera one, camera two, and camera three. So sim so Symbiopsychotaxiplasm's camera one is filming a scene of a husband and wife arguing in the park. She's accusing him of being secretly gay and making her get lots of abortions because of that. Throughout the film, the actors in the scene randomly change, and so does the location. And also the script is terrible, on purpose. Yesterday you were a fag, today you're not, tomorrow you're just going to fuck the little rabbits or chipmunks here in the park. How about that, huh? You are Why don't really you try sick. a mosquito next? So that's camera one. Now camera two is the camera filming the actors and William Greaves. This is best demonstrated by this scene where camera one runs out of film. Look now, I have put up with your escapades long enough. I mean, I saw you two just... Cut. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, ran out of film there. Uh, do you want to? Uh, well, this camera also catches Greaves being a bad director and the actors not understanding how they're supposed to play the scene. If you could take it, if you could take it slower, you know, I mean, pull away from him. You know, pull away from him. I have the feeling yeah. you say that she is going home. Right. And that's she's going home. Right. And she's like, you right. Know, she, I don't know whether to be a little faggy. Yes. Right. Uh, oh. Or not. Uh, mm -hmm. I have explored the, uh, the kind of thing, and I don't know whether this is a faggy fag or a butch fag. Yeah. Uh, whether it's a guy that goes around and says, all right, you sons of bitches, all right, you cock, you motherfucker. And, you know, you well, know. So that's camera two. Camera three is the camera that's filming anything and everything else in the area. Greaves explains it best here as he's getting into character as the shitty, horny director. Like, the, the, if you see cars going by, you can integrate that into the general action if you want to. Or if you see an old lady walking a dog, here's an old lady. Well, I don't understand. Right what did you here. say about uh, I'm, who's supposed to be in charge of the actors? I mean, filming the actors? Uh, like, oh, here's that woman with the tits. Hey, uh, hey, here, there's, there's the one right down there. Just get her, get her. She's there now. They're bouncing Japs. Camera three is the best part, in my opinion. It gives us the crew complaining and sleeping on the job, random passerby, a cop asking for permits, a group of teenagers who wanted to watch. I know you're looking for a new star. I know you're looking for a new star. Let me introduce you. <laughs> after they finished filming, camera three also recorded the crew on their own after the shoot, trying to figure out uh, what the fuck they just filmed. Now the director does not know that we are photographing you know, this scene. We're doing it on our own. Well, we were sitting around the other night and we, and in talking, a few of us, we realized that here is, a, here is an open-ended film with no plot that we can see, with no end that we can see, and an action that we can't follow. He doesn't know how to direct. He's into blocking. <laughs> That's what he does, he sits down, he gives movement. It seems to me there's some exploration of the levels of reality um, and the supra levels of reality. Okay, so this is a, even another level of reality that we're establishing For here. For all anybody knows, you know, Bill is standing right outside the door and he's directing this whole scene. All right, it could be. Nobody knows. Maybe we're all acting. All right, maybe we're all acting. So anyway, this whole mess was edited together and presented out of order and it all culminates in an attempt to do this scene as a musical. Come on. Don't touch me. Alice? No. Alice? No, no. Come on, sport. And the final bit, like the last 20 minutes of the film, is just footage of a houseless guy named Victor who saw the crew filming and really wanted to be in the movie. My name is Victor Bukowski, um, darling. What is this? ABC Bob. camera. You know what F is? I, I coined that phrase. Yeah, what is it? You know what? Fuck. Yeah. That's why I want. You never knew what that meant? I don't You don't know. Are you so such a virgin like I am? <laughs> We're not virgins, baby. We're virgins in the brain. So after completing the film, William Greaves originally planned to make four sequels and create a five film arc. But when he submitted it to the Cannes Film Festival in 1971, it was rejected because the world wasn't ready for whatever this was. Thinking that was the end of it, Greaves put the film in his closet and nobody saw it again until 1991, when the Brooklyn Museum did a retrospective of Greaves' career and a curator discovered the unreleased film. After the screening, Greaves began showing the film at film festivals, and in 1992, fellow kid himself Steve Buscemi saw it at the Sundance Film Festival when he was there for the premiere of Reservoir Dogs. And being the weird little guy he is, he absolutely loved it. It was my first time at the festival, and I was you know, very excited to see other films and looking in the programs. Uh, but the one that caught my eye in the program was a title that I couldn't pronounce, and uh, was watching the film, and about halfway through the film, the projector broke. And Bill Greaves sort of just ambled down the aisle and got up in front of the audience and said, well, we seem to be experiencing technical difficulties, but I'll take any questions you have so far. I was convinced that this was part of a film performance. You know, I was really sure of it. I went, ah, oh, this is all planned. <laughs> this is brilliant. Fast forward a few years later, and another famous Steve saw the film too. Together with Steve Buscemi, the two Steves put their mind and money together to help William Greaves create one of the sequels he wanted to make all along. So on November 2nd, 2003, William Greaves got some of the gang back together and took them to Central Park to finally film Symbio Psycho Taxi Blossom, take two and a half.
The sequel opens with about 20 minutes of previously unseen footage from the first film. We see the team hanging out on a roof, more of the breakup scene, more of Greaves directing, more of the crew trying to figure out what the fuck they just filmed. The people out there, you know, in the audience, you know, this is without, you know, I mean, they don't know what, you know, this never happened before. I mean, this is happening, not only is it happening to us at this moment, but every time it gets played in the theater, it's gonna happen to them. Then we get to see a Q&A with William Greaves and friends at a film festival as they talk about making the film and their plans for the sequel. And then as they're talking about the sequel, the sequel actually starts, except the sequel already started at this point, so, but now it's actually starting, um, which, that hurts my brain. Just like in Take One, we got a fake movie scene in Central Park. It's the same characters from last time, and now they're reuniting after breaking up 35 years ago. Same camera setup too, except this time, there's a Steve Buscemi cam. Who is this cameraman? He's a from is he from Brooklyn? Does he have a passport? Does he have a pass? Hey fella, have you got a passport from Brooklyn? I don't need a passport, pal. I beg your pardon? Now, objectively speaking, this sequel is not as good as the original but that's kind of the point. It's very obvious that Greaves couldn't manufacture conflict like he did last time because he couldn't fool anyone. Everyone saw the first movie and everyone was in on the joke this time. Movies need some form of conflict and it's that lack of conflict that is the conflict of the movie. Greaves made a sequel knowing full well the sequel can't be as good as the original because he's lost the element of surprise. It's kind of like what happened to the Eric Andre show. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Eric Andre show! <laughs> if you aren't familiar, the Eric Andre show is a surrealist parody of late night shows where Eric Andre and Hannibal Burris do elaborate unhinged pranks on their guests. In the first few years, Eric Andre got genuine reactions out of the celebrity guests because most didn't know what the show was and didn't know what was going to happen. It was really great. What is that? Do you know? It's like a, it's like some type of like, uh, gray food or something. Oh, God, you, Jack! <laughs> what did he say? Yeah, how about these prices? <laughs> <laughs> Which price do you like better? What is going on? This is what my real voice sounds like. <laughs> But when the show came back in 2020 after a four year break, the guests knew what they were walking into. Everyone knew who Eric Andre was now. He was in the live action Lion King movie. He couldn't shock a reality TV star in trying to get his show canceled by eating fake vomit in front of her anymore. It's still funny, but the newer episodes have lost a bit of that edge the older episodes had. The same thing happened with the symbiotics the same thing happened with the Symbio Psycho Taxi Plasm sequel. Greaves knew the edge was gone and made that the point of the movie, coupled with the fact that this ended up being the last film Greaves ever made, and it's pretty clear what he was going for. Symbio Psycho Taxi Plasm, take two and a half, is a sequel about how Greaves couldn't actually make a good sequel. So in a way, Greaves basically created the sequel is not as good as the original, the movie. What has film school done to me? So that's the story of Psycho Sim... Fuck. If you liked what you saw, I really recommend you check out the films yourself because explaining them is just not the same as watching them. Both films are not that long, pretty easy to find, and a lot of fun to watch. With or without drugs. I am Evasive. Thanks so much for watching. Please like and subscribe and favorite and do whatever, I, I don't really care. I have a terrible headache right now, so I'm gonna go for a walk and get some sunlight. Bye guys.